Okay, so good day to all of you. So we are already chapter 10, all about system architecture. So let's start a discussion. So the following are the chapter objectives. So provide a checklist of issues to consider when selecting a system architecture. Describe servers, server-based processing, clients, and client-based processing. Explain client-server architecture, including peers, cost-benefit issues and performance, and then compare in-house e-commerce development with packaged solutions, discuss the potential impact of cloud computing and Web 2.0, explain the difference between online and batch processing, define network topology, including hierarchical, bus, ring, and star models, explain network protocols and licensing issues, Describe wireless networking, including wireless standards, topologies, and trends, and then describe the system design specification. So for the introduction for this chapter, an effective system combines elements into an architecture or design that is flexible, cost-effective, technically sound, and able to support the information needs of the business. So the description of an effective system is... It is flexible, cost-effective, technically sound, and able to support the information needs of the business. So system architecture translates the logical design of an information system into a physical structure that includes hardware, software, network support, and processing methods. So this is all about Chapter 10, the system architecture that... Um, it includes the hardware, software, network support, and processing methods. So for the system architecture checklist, so first is we have the enterprise resource planning or the ERP. So what is the objective of ERP is to establish a company-wide strategy for using IT resources. So an example of ERP is the supply chain management. So what is supply chain management or SEM? Um, it contains, for example, what if your company has an inventory? Then if you do not have the supply chain management, every time that your inventory has, uh, has already uh, low in stocks, you need to manually call the supplier for, you to, uh, for them to provide you the stocks that are needed. But if you already have supply chain management and for that SCM um, software, if you have this threshold and then the stock below uh, drops below the threshold, it will automatically um, notify the supplier without even a human intervention that it needs attention that they are already low on product. So that is an example of an enterprise resource planning. So another one is we have to consider the initial cost and the TCO or the total cost of ownership. So during the final stage, design stage, you make decisions that will have a major impact on the initial costs and TCO for the new system. So, you should review all previous cost estimates. If it is correct or if there is a correction, so you need to um, correct it if possible. Of course, because we are already to talking financial cost. Okay, next, another checklist for system architecture is the scalability. So, it is also called extensibility refers to a system's ability to expand, change, or downsize easily to meet the changing needs of a business enterprise. So, scalability is actually very important in implementing systems that are volume-rated, such as transaction processing system. So, scalability is, is, means to expand or downsize. For example, for uh, transaction processing system, if it can uh, uh, cater customers simultaneously uh, 100 persons um, can for example if you already added additional uh, 50 persons uh, will the performance of the transaction processing system will be slower if you add additional 50 if it is slower it will be slower so it means it's not that scalable in terms of the volume of clients but if it still can handle 50 or another uh, 100 customers it's already 200 and it does not affect the performance so it means that your uh, transaction processing system is scalable so next another checklist is web integration 
So, an information systems includes applications. So, you, do you want that your system architecture be web-centric? So, the, the advantage of web-centric architecture is that it avoids many of the connectivity and compatibility problems that typically arise. As you can remember, the web-based database design because you just only need a browser and an internet connection. So you do not need to consider what platform or what operating system does the computer must have for it to be compatible with the, uh, with the, uh, the use of the, uh, for example, for, for the information system. So web integration also includes in e-marketplaces. So another one is legacy system interface requirements. So the new system might have to interface with one or more legacy systems. Uh, legacy systems, these are uh, old information systems or old database management systems that are still running. Um, it is already old, so you're going to ask why, why are these companies still using the legacy system? Because for them, converting it to a new system will jeopardize the, the data that, uh, that the legacy system has stored. So the, the, the company solution is to create a new system that can communicate or can be integrated with the legacy system. So here in the Philippines, there are still banks that are the, the, uh, that is using legacy systems. So interfacing a new system with a legacy system involves analysis of data formats and compatibility. So if you want to integrate your new system with a legacy system, you have to consider the data formats that the legacy systems system is using so that if you're going to, um, uh, there is no, the data integrity is still intact. And of course, it's compatibility. And then the analyst must know if the new application eventually will replace the legacy system. Another uh, reason as, as to why legacy system is not, there are some companies that they're not yet replacing their legacy system because it's very expensive. That is the other reason. So again, with regards to legacy system, if, you, if your company does not have a legacy system, then it should not be a problem. But if you do have a legacy system in, in your company, you have to consider how does the new system will interface or uh, and then how will the data that the new system is processing will be integrated with the legacy system's data. Okay, next check uh, the checklist is the processing options. In planning the architecture, designers also must consider how the system will process data online or in batches. So by means of online, it means that uh, your processing is on demand. For example, if you're going to buy a product in an e-commerce website, if you uh, check out and you are going to, to buy that product, if you already checked it out, and then you've uh, you've already um, uh, selected your mode of payment. So that's an example of an online processing because it will automatically reflect that you already bought that uh, that you already bought that item. While in batches, it means that um, you have to process the data in batches. Uh, one example is uh, in our in our case, for example, in our daily time record. For our daily time record, uh, these are processed in batches. They are not processed on demand or online. For example, um, when when there's no pandemic yet, our day uh, our daily time record for the afternoon is uh, processed in wee hours because of course there there uh, there are no people using there are no people who are using the system. So the bandwidth is very uh, uh, effect uh, very efficient. So that's why it is uh, it is processed by batches, not uh, online. And then provision must be made for backup and speedy recovery in the event of system failure. So you have to have a backup and you must recover immediately, specifically if your company or you, uh, you have a web-based information system. Okay, another checklist is security issues. Security threats and defenses are a major concern to a systems analyst. So, security threats such as, for example, unauthorized access inside your company. So, that is already included. So, the analyst must consider security issues that relate to systems design specification. So, if it is a traditional 
uh, design or system design. So the only concern for security issues is, of course, for physical. So your data must be backed up somewhere within the company or off-site so that if calamities uh, will uh, happen, so you still have another copy of your data or again, the unauthorized access. But if your system is web-based, uh, they introduce additional security concerns, of course, because of it can be exploited by, uh, by of course, by, uh, by hackers. So you have to be very careful with regards and plan for security of your system. Okay, planning the architecture is, of course, you need to consider first is the servers. So again, the servers, they act as a data repository and uh, they also are the ones that processes the data. So we have the server. Do we need clients? So clients, uh, they access the resources of uh, coming from the server. And then we have this mainframe architecture. So mainframe, this acts as a server. And then we have the so-called terminal. So these terminals are diskless, meaning um, the, all the processing that these terminals uh, is done in the mainframe. So that's why they are diskless. They're only composed of a, com of a uh, CPU and a memory, a random access memory. Uh, and then the processing is happening in the mainframe. So because of this mainframe architecture, it is also called server-based processing. So next is, do we need clients? So of course, we need clients. So what is that? Is that a FAT13 client? So later on, we're going to differentiate the differ uh, differentiate between a FAT and a thin client. As PC technology exploded in the mid-1980s and 1990s, powerful microcomputers quickly appeared on corporate desktops. Users found that they could turn their own word processing spreadsheet and database applications. As I've said, with server-based processing, all your word processing, spreadsheet, database applications, and any other applications is done on the server. So because of these microcomputers, they discovered that they can, um, they can install applications on their client computers. So companies link the standalone computers into network. So, so for it to have a network, so this is standalone, meaning standalone, um, it can operate on their own unlike let us return with these terminals they cannot uh, 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 they cannot operate on on their own because as i've said these are disk less this this only compose of the cpu and a memory so then again it is connected to the mainframe compared to clients specifically the standalone computers actually what the computers what we're using now these are already standalone computers um, they you can, they can operate on it's not they can operate on their own but you can run your own programs here you can you can create your own uh, applications and create documents and other um, uh, things and productivity tools that you can use. Okay, so for clients, as we have this standalone computing, so to connect it to a network, we have local and wide area networks. So local area network or LAN and wide area network or uh, WAN. Example, uh, our, our network I think it, in our campus, it's already a local area network. So a connection between our network and to the main, uh, to the main campus, so that is already considered as a wide area network. So since that um, applications are processed in the clients because the client computers has their own disk, hard disk, CPU, and memory, there are called client-based processing. So this is the client-server architecture. So we have uh, an example for a file server and a client server. So for our file server, so the client requests data file to the server, and the server will respond. So the server transmits the entire data file to the client. So that is the file server design. And then for a client server design, so the client submits data query to the server and then the server responds. The server transmits only the result of the client query. So that's the difference between file server design and client server design. 
So these are also variations of client server design styles. So for a database server, so client transmits SQL commands and then the server transmits results of the SQL execution. For the transaction server, so the client triggers transaction to the serve to the transaction server and the server executes set of SQL commands and verifies results. So for the objects uh, for the with the object server, so it can compose of more server objects and then client objects here in this example can also compose of different client objects. So client object messages and at the say at end client server object messages also. And then for the web server, so the client transmits internet communication and the web server can also transmit internet communication. So we have this, the so-called fat and thin client. So fat client is, can also be called thick client. So let us um, differentiate the different, uh, differentiate fat and thin client. So for the network traffic, so for fat client, it is higher because the flat, fat client must communicate more often with the server to access data and update processing results. Okay, fat client, it means that you can process the the data in the client while thin client uh, the the processing is done in the server so for network traffic it is higher for the fat client for the thin client it is lower because most interaction between code and data takes place at the server and then for the performance uh, for fat it is lower because more network traffic is required and then for the thin client, it is faster because less network traffic is required. For the initial cost, for fat client, it is higher because more powerful hardware is required. Because as I've said, the application, pro the processing of data is done in the actual client. So the initial cost is higher. And then for thin client, it is lower because workstation hardware requirements are not as stringent. And then next is we have maintenance cost. It is also higher for the fat client because more program code resides on the client. And then for thin client, it is lower because most program code resides on the central server. And this is the only advantage of fat client. So we have ease of development. It is easier for fat client because systems resemble traditional file server designs where all processing was performed in, at the client. So for thin client, it is more difficult because developers must optimize the division of processing logic. So with regards to ease of development, this is only the advantage of fat client compared to thin client. Okay, next is we have the client server tiers. So we have a two-tier design. Two-tier design means for the client, the client has the user interface. And then for the, for the server, uh, there is the application where the data is processed. So that's the two-tier design. Three-tier means just the same with a two-tier design. It's just that in the, uh, at the middle of client server, there is an application logic that, for example, since uh, the, day, uh, day, uh, the request coming from the client will be processed by the application logic and then it will be transformed so that the server can... Um, process the data uh, that is uh, converted by the application logic. So that is the three-tier design. Three-tier design is also called an N-tier design. Okay? So next is we have the middleware. So middleware enables the peers to communicate and pass data back and forth. And it provides a transparent interface and can integrate legacy systems and web-based applications. So what are the cost benefit issues for client server architecture? Client server systems enable the firm to scale the system in a rapidly changing environment. So that is the advantage of client uh, servers because you can add clients to the, uh, to the setup. And then client server computing also allows companies to transfer applications from expensive mainframes to less expensive client platforms. Since clients are standalone computers, you can transfer the application 
for, uh, to the client alone, not just uh, done uh, solely or exclusively the application to the server. And then client server systems reduce network load and improve response times. Of course, what if your client simultaneously access the server? There, there will be a bottleneck. There is a slow performance or response time of the server. So if you have, uh, if the client can already process the, the data, so there will be a reduced network load and response times uh, coming from the server. Okay, next is we have the client-server performance issue. In contrast to the centralized system, a client-server design separates applications and data. So that's the, the, the tier design, the two-tier. It separates the application or the processing of data and uh, the application and, of course, the data. And then we also have the distributed database management system or DDBMS. So with regards to that, if one, if one of them is down, so there is another backup in which you can, uh, you can restore the operations of the system. And then the system is scalable, so new data sites can be added without reworking the system design. And then the system is likely to experience, is less likely to experience catastrophic failure because of DDBMS. And it, it is distributed uh, because um, uh, w if one server fails, another server can take the place of the uh, of the uh, of the server that it, that has crashed. Okay, next is we have the internet-based architecture. So developing e-commerce solutions in-house. Again, if you do have an IT department, you can up to have an in-house development for e-commerce solutions. So guidelines for in-house e-commerce site development. So these are the following. Analyze the company's business needs and develop a clear statement of your goals. Consider the experience of other companies with similar projects. So you can consult with other companies or ask their experiences with regards uh, to, to those uh, similar projects such as yours. Obtain input from users to understand the business and technology issues involved in the project. So again, you have to uh, get input from the users because they're the ones who's going to use the system. Plan for future growth, but aim for ease of use. Determine whether the IT staff has the necessary skills and experience to implement the project. Of course, though you already have an IT department, but they don't have enough skills, you have to consider that if you're going to build it in-house or not. Consider training, additional resources, and the use of consultants if necessary. The next is consider integration requirements for existing legacy systems or enterprise resource planning. As I've said, if your company has a legacy system, you have to consider the interfacing so that there will be no problems with integration between the new system and the legacy system. Select a physical infrastructure carefully so it will support the applications, application now and later. Okay, next. Develop the project in modular form so users can test and approve the functional elements as you go along. So you have to develop the project not as a whole. For example, you're going to test it after you've already finished the project. You have to uh, test it, uh, develop it by unit, and then test it individually so that uh, you can already pinpoint earlier bugs and problems that you will encounter while developing the system. And then next is connect the application to existing in-house systems and verify interactivity. For example, if you've already finished the application and it is, uh, it's not for final, but for testing, you should incorporate it to the existing in-house system and verify if they have this, if the integration is successful or not, or are, are, are the two systems interacting or not. And then last is we have test every aspect of the site exhaustively. And then consider a preliminary rollout to a pilot group to obtain feedback before a full launch. So you have to test your um, system and then do not test, uh, do not uh, implement the information system at a full launch. 
the uh, the better is you have to have a pilot site where your information system will be tested and then if it's already um functional and it is already there are no problems encountered then set uh, set for a schedule for a full launch okay next is we have if it is in-house another alternative is to package solutions and e-commerce service providers so many vendors offer turnkey systems for companies so turnkey systems meaning these are um, systems that uh, can be set up quickly and can be used quickly by companies. So that is why they are called turnkey systems. Uh, examples of that is Microsoft. And another alternative is to use an application service provider or ASP. So, but then again, as a previous discussion, ASP, prov uh, it has a subscription fee for you to use the application of the company offering the ASP. And another option is managed hosting. Then uh, it in case you can't buy expensive servers, you can um, um, have this managed hosting. Again, it has a subscription fee. And then consider the experience of other companies in the same industry. So since you are already in the same industry, and since if you are already, if you're still new in the industry, you can ask experience of other companies with regards to their um um, what 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 we're, go we're we're going to use? Are we going to use package solutions, e-commerce service providers, or we're going to develop in-house? So you have to ask for uh, advice to other companies. Okay, next is we have corporate portals. So a corporate portal can provide access for customers, employees, suppliers, and the public. So these corporate portals are available in the internet you just need to have a user id and password to authenticate that you are really uh, uh, has an authorized access for these portals and then we also have this cloud computing so effectively eliminates compatibility issues because again cloud computing is web-based so again you just need an internet browser and an internet connection so scaling is on demand so because cloud computing um, if you if you're going to use cloud computing technology, so of course many are going can access your resources. So because of that, it requires significantly more bandwidth. So for cloud computing, just to make sure you have enough bandwidth to process those applications and data. Okay, next is we have Web 2.0. So, envisions a second generation of the web that will enable people to collaborate, interact, and share information more dynamically. So, again, for Web 2.0, it means that there is, of course, a Web 1.0 or Web 1.0. So, it means that you can use the web just by researching, downloading, or uh, uploading of files. Actually, for Web 1.0, uh, 1 there are no interactions. So these are just the typical websites for information. So these are the examples. So for Web 2.0, uh, the, the difference with Web 1.0 and Web 2.0 is that Web 2.0 has this characteristic of interaction of online users. So it starts with, uh, with for example, with, uh, with social media um, sites. You can comment. You can comment on your... Uh, on your friend's post. Uh, another is you can um, you, you can also um, play games with your uh, that's the, the that's the important characteristic of Web 2.0 the interaction you can play games with your uh, with your friends even you are not physically present or you're not at the same on the same uh, location so that that is the characteristic of Web 2.0. So another as as we have for we have is wiki so meaning uh, the not just web 1. Point, uh, web 1.0 that the content the content of the website just depends of course of the of the company who posted the website who maintains the website for wiki the user can contribute content and then we also have this internet operating system so meaning um, they can work with the uh, the operating system 
it's not really installed in your PC, but it's in the uh, web. Okay, next is we have processing methods. So we have online processing. Because it is interactive, online processing avoids delays and allows a constant dialogue between the user and the system. So e-marketplaces, e-commerce sites, there are online processing. So online processing also can be used with file-oriented systems. So an example here is the ATM query process that uh, online processing can be used with file-oriented systems. So we have this example. So step one, customer enters his or her account number and requests an account balance. So that is number one. Okay. And then step number two, retrieves current account balance uh, coming from the customer file and then it will uh, in the online processing system. And then step three, verifies bank account number and displays balance on the ATM screen. So that is step three, displaying on the ATM screen. So uh, though this is a file-oriented system, but there is an incorporation of online processing system for ATM query process. Okay, next is we have the batch processing. As I've said, an example of batch processing is um, it's unlike online processes that it is on demand that when you click the buy button or the checkout button, it will be automatically reflected that you bought the item. For batch processing, there is a scheduled time in which the, uh, the system will process all the data. So the IT operations group can run batch programs on a predetermined schedule, as I've said, without user involvement re during regular business hours at night or on weekends. Requires significantly, significantly fewer network resources than online systems. As I've said, our daily time record is scheduled to be processed every, um, I, I don't know, 12 midnight, the time where no one is using the uh, network. Okay, but you can also combine the online and batch processing. So this is an example of a point of sale processing. So the post terminal, so we have a post program which is online and then it will store or update the inventory database and then uh, it will also retrieve uh, the, the, uh, the information from the inventory database and then it will have this sales transaction file and then next it will be um, processed for the daily sales program but it is done by batch and then it will be stored in the accounting files and any time that the daily sales program requires uh, data from accounting it can also be retrieved and then of course the product is or the output is a daily, daily sales report coming from the daily sales program that is processed in batch okay next is we have the network model since we're talking about system architecture we need to uh, delve on the network so the osi reference model it consists of seven layers so each layer performs a specific function and offers a set of design standards so we have seven layers we have the layer one is the physical layer, contains physical components that carry data such as cabling and connectors. So that is the uh, physical layer. And then for number two, the data link layer defines specific methods of transmitting data over the physical layer, such as defining the start and end of a data frame. And then for layer number three, we have network layer defines network addresses and determines how data packets are routed over the network. And then layer number four, transport layer, provides reliable data flow and error recovery. And then layer number five is session layer, defines control structures that manage the communications link between computers. And then layer number six, we have the presentation layer, ensures that data is uniformly structured and formatted for network transmission and last but not the least layer number seven is the application layer provides network services requested by a local workstation 
So aside from the OSI model, we have the network protocols. In all cases, the network must use a protocol. The most commonly used for internet connection is we have the transmission control protocol slash internet protocol or the TCP IP and also the file transfer protocol. So for tra file transfer protocol, this is the one that is responsible so that you can download and upload files. Okay, aside from the uh, protocols, we also have network topology. So our first type of topology is the hierarchical network. It mirrors the actual operational flow in the organization. So one disadvantage of a hierarchical network is that if a business adds additional processing levels, the network becomes more complex and expensive to operate and maintain. So we have this network server. This is the top. And then it, ha it is connected to the different uh, PC terminal, departmental server, or other departmental server. And then these servers are uh, connected. The PC terminals uh, under the department are connected. So what if you will add another layer in here? So that is why that is the uh, disadvantage of a hierarchical network. It will become more complex and expensive to operate and maintain. So next is we have the bus network. So the characteristic of the bus of a bus network is that devices can be attached or detached from the network at any point without disturbing the rest of the network. So overall performance declines as more users and device, uh, devices are added because for a bus network, the bandwidth is shared. So that's why if you add more um, users, the performance declines. And then today, the bus design is much less popular because we are using other topology net, uh, network topologies. We have another one. We have the ring network. So its characteristics is one disadvantage of a ring network is that if a network device fails, such as a PC or a server, the devices downstream from the failed device cannot communicate with the network. So for example, um, there is a, uh, a failure here. So meaning, so the, dev uh, the downstream, it cannot, uh, the, the printer, the scanner cannot uh, uh, cannot be connected if they are the downstream from the failed device. Okay. And then we have a multi-station access unit as an example of a ring network. Okay, next is we have a star network. So, star network is composed of a departmental server and then there is a switch. So, the disadvantage of the star design is that the entire network is dependent on the switch. As you can see, it's like switch is the, centra the centralized uh, controller for all the connected devices. And this ensures that there is a connection in the departmental server. So, however, in most large star networks, backup switches are available immediately in case of hardware failure. So, to, sol so to solve the disadvantage of the star design is that there are back up switches that in case this uh, switch uh, will fail because of overload uh, over, uh, overload connection so there are back switches available not so not to interrupt the network services okay then we have another one is we have the mesh network so its characteristics while this design is extremely reliable because as you can see uh, every devices they are connected they have they have a dedicated um, connection from one resource to another it is also very expensive to install because of course for a terminal so if you're one two three four five six a uh, one two three four five if you have five network resources so for terminal you can connect to one two three four max uh, four devices so it's very expensive and it's very difficult to maintain because of the complexity what if for example your resources or the devices are 100 so it means your device can be connected to 99 devices uh, in, uh, in dedicated lines so it's very difficult to maintain and expensive and then originally developed for military operations so 
what we're using uh, uh, commonly used is the star network because we're using switches. Okay, next is we have routers. So routers differ from switches in that they work at a higher OSI level. Because why? So switches, uh, they are uh, for connecting the network devices while the router is connected directly to the internet. Can connect to a larger dissimilar network such as the internet. So routers serve as a gateway uh, from to, to the internet and a proxy server. Okay, next is we have network modeling tools. So as you translate the OSI logical model into a physical model of the network system, you can use software tools. So for this example, we have Microsoft Visio. So it has its own network modeling tools. But of course, um, there are, uh, of course, there are licensing issues. And of course, Microsoft Visio is not for free. So, the network licensing issues is the software licensing restrictions. Okay, next is we have wireless networks. So, a wireless local area network or WLAN. So, this wireless uh, network has a wireless network standards. We have the 802.11 um, by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. So, its complete name for wireless network standard is IEEE 802.11. So, there are amendments, different amendments because, of course, uh, wireless connections, uh, it has evolved specifically with the range and the, uh, the, the how large uh, uh, can, can be transmitted by using wireless networks. So, these amendments such as 802 Point eleven A, eight zero two point eleven B, eight zero two point eleven G, and eight zero two point eleven N. So these are the amendments. So uh, it operates on megabits per second or per second or Mbps. So we have this eight zero two point eleven G and eight zero two point eleven N. So which is better, of course, is eight zero two point eleven N because. It has, uh, it has faster bandwidth, and at the same time, it has a more coverage. And then we have this MIMO, the multiple input and multiple output. Uh, this is the characteristic of a, of a wireless network, and it is also a multi-path design. So since we already have 802.11n, so what is this 802.11y? So actually, this is not a type of... Uh, connection strength of a wireless network it's more of so the ieee 802.11y enables data transfer uh, equipment to operate using 802.11a protocol so it's not really a connection for example oh it's 802.11y so it means it's the fast it's it's faster than 802.11n no it's just a um, amendment for the IEEE 802.11 network, wireless network standard. Okay, what are the basic network topologies? So we have the basic service set or BSS, or these are also called the infrastructure mode. So this is the uh, wireless access point, the WAP, the WPA, PSK. So if you're going to connect uh, into a wireless connection. So that is already a basic survey, service set. So they're using access points. Of course, the nearer you are to the access point, the higher the, the signal is or the bandwidth signal. And then what is this extended service set or ESS? ESS is composed of two or more BSS. So that is why it is called extended service set. It has a characteristic of roaming. So since it is an ex uh, composed of two or more BSS. For example, you are in a campus and then you have ESS. Then from your location, from your office, you are connected to to your uh, to the nearest to the nearest uh, uh, wireless access point. And then, for example, you 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 went to another building that has another BSS. So this roaming means 
if you went from one location to another, since you're already near, of course, you're already far from the access point that is in your office, and then you went to another building. So by means of roaming, you will be connected to the other basic service set uh, without uh, interrupting your connectivity. So that is the meaning of roaming. So depending on the on the proximity of of your uh, uh, access uh, of you from the access point, you can transfer the connection from one um, e, e, uh, BSS to another without uh, again interrupting your internet connection. So that is the characteristic of ESS. So what is this independent service set or ISS? So this means that the user which has an internet or wireless uh, network capability they can create their own network so that is why it is called peer-to-peer -peer mode or we have the other term for this one iss is the ad hoc mode again ad hoc mode or iss or peer-to-peer -peer mode is that the user as long as it has a uh, uh, the device has a wireless radio uh, then he or she can create a network without um, considering the available if it is a BSS or ESS in the company. So that is the independent service set. So wireless trends is we have the Wi-Fi alliance. So Wi-Fi meanings, meaning wireless fidelity. Okay, so actually it is just already in the norm now, but Wi-Fi, it just means wireless fidelity, meaning uh, unlike wired, which is more stable internet connection. Wireless fidelity does not really ring true for the, uh, for the characteristic of wireless networks. Why? Uh, wireless networks depends on the, if there are obstructions or obstacle in the, uh, with regards to the transfer of, or the uh, transmitting signal. For example, in an open space, your wireless network uh, uh, has a 100% uh, signal. And then what if a tree is, uh, is uh, for example, with your uh, wireless access uh, point or your uh, wireless access, access point and then you are in a tree, uh, you are between a tree. So meaning the 100% um, signal will be lessened because of the tree. And then if there is a wall, a concrete wall, there's also a problem. So that's why uh, it's not called anymore wireless fidelity. It's just now because it's common term. So that's why it's just Wi-Fi. But with the real term with wireless fidelity, it's not used anymore because uh, uh, if there is a, uh, obstacles or obstructions, the signal uh, that is transmitted will be lessened. Okay. And then we also have Bluetooth. So this is used for transferring files with e without even using an internet connection. And then, on addition to 802.11 protocols for LANs, IEEE is working on 802.16 standards. So, what are these 802.16 standards? So, these are called wireless MAN. So, that is MAN, Metropolitan Area Networks. Of course, it's bigger. So, MAN meaning there is an internet connection for a city. And then, this is also called WiMAX. So, I don't know which company uses the term WiMAX here in the Philippines. But in, in, in other countries, WiMAX is different. Because I've, as I've read from, from internet resources, WiMAX is example. The whole province has a free internet connection wherever you go. Where, wherever, if you're on the mountain or you're on the side of the, the sea. If you have WiMAX, you can access an internet connection. It's like a very big umbrella in which you can connect. Um, actually, it's not yet. Actually, it's already available in the countries a long time ago. But the problem here in the Philippines is because of, of course, um, that's why um, the government wants to have a third, um, a third telecommunication company so that those two tel telcos will not monopolize the market. And uh, for your information, um, our internet connection here in the Philippines is one of the most expensive in the ASEAN 
in the ASEAN region. So that's why um, there should have a third telco. So there is a competitive, um, a, a, a competitive, and to break the monopoly of those two um, giant telcos in in our in our country. So if if there is if there is a competition, so their services will be their services will be better, and we can already achieve this so-called Y max. Okay, next is we have systems design completion. So we have this document, the system design specification. So it has a structure similar to the following. We have the management summary. We have the system components, system environment, implementation requirements, time and cost estimates, and additional material. So for system design, so you need to have a user approval. So users must review and approve the interface design, report and menu designs, data entry screens, source documents, and other areas of the system that affect them. Of course, because they're the ones who's going to use the system later on. So that's why they should already see the design. If it is uh, so that they can already expect, oh, so this is the design, this is the user interface, uh, uh, it's easier, okay, it's good. So you will, you should need an approval from the user. Other IT department members also need to review the system design specification for, su uh, for additional suggestions and recommendations. And then when the system design specification is complete, you distribute the document to a target group of users, IT department personnel, and company management for information. Next is we have presentations. So the first presentation is to the systems analyst, programmers, and technical support staff members. Your next presentation is to department managers and users from departments affected by the system. And then the final presentation is for company management. And then management might reach one of the three decisions. So proceed with systems development, perform additional work on the systems design phase. If there are other, uh, they want additional information or they have, they want to incorporate their suggestions and recommendations. Or worst case is uh, what if the management wants to terminate the project. Okay, so we already finished with chapter 10. So the summary for this lecture. So an information system combines hardware, software, data, procedures, and people into a system architecture. The analyst must consider enterprise resource planning, initial cost and TCO, scalability, web integration, legacy interface requirements, processing options, and security issues. And then an architecture requires servers and clients. Compared to file server designs, Client-server systems are more scalable and flexible. And in implementing a design, an analyst should consider e-commerce strategies, the availability of package solutions, and corporate portals, which are entrances to a multifunction website. And the primary processing methods are online and botch processing. Networks allow the sharing of hardware, software, and data resources in order to reduce expenses and provide more capability to users. The way a network is configured is called the network topology. And then the system design specification presents the complete systems design for an information system. So we're already finished with chapter 10. So I hope that you learned something from this lecture. If you do have a question, feel free to comment below. And please don't forget to like my YouTube channel. So again, thank you very much and good day to all of you.